It's okay. It's okay. Yes. I think it requires... Hey! I have enough hair. I have enough hair to do certain things. We're squirrels outside. I'm very distracted. I gave them my grapes. Well, okay, so... Last time I went to the grocery store, I got the grapes that I love. They're red grapes and they called Sweet Celebration. Um, but there weren't very many left. So I took one bag of those and then the ones that were more prominent and fresh were big fat green grapes called Autumn Crisp. So I was like, oh, okay. They taste like nothing. Like they have no flavor. They don't have a unpleasant flavor. Hi, Hannah F. I'm good, how are you? Good morning. They don't have an unpleasant flavor. They just don't have any flavor. So they're not, they're like not yummy. So I've given all of them to the squirrels. I don't know, maybe the birds take them too, but I actually see the squirrels eating them. So, cause I didn't want to let them be wasteful. You can hear them out there. I'm just gonna go look at them. I'm not actually this orange. All my lights are kind of yellowy orange, amber kind of color. But um, on the screen, at least for me, it looks very orange. I'm just gonna check on my on my little out my window here. Hello, hello. So I just felt like reading out loud. And we only have a little bit left of this. Let me clue the leaning chimney. Also, you want to see someone? This is, he's still here. He's pretty much finished. I just have to make some more carrots. I really don't like the way his little, it was supposed to be a basket, but um, this, this yarn that I used, I can't felt it, so it's like pretty floppy. I already have, how many carrots do I have? Um, and I, I didn't put any green on the top. I just didn't feel like it. So I have one, two, three, four. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, it's just my screen colors are, ooh. Uh, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten carrots in here, but they, when they're all in here, they don't really stick out very much. And that is quite a haul of carrots. They're all needle felted, kind of hard to see because they're orange and everything else is orange. But um, I mean, I just put them in here, but you know, I wanted them to just be more prominent. But I think 10 carrots is pretty good. Yeah, I really don't like this. I had some better yarn I could have used, more nicer yarn. But it, uh, the color, it was too, it was too similar to the color of the bunny. And so it didn't really show, but I just love his heftiness. I'm going to, he's like a really big boy. He's a tummy ache. No, he's not meant to be Peter Rabbit, but I just happen to have this blue color for his shirt that makes him kind of look Peter Rabbit-ish after he, ate every carrot in the land. And then his bag just kind of like sits on his, on his, uh, on his arm like that. And he's got his floppy ears. <laughs> in hindsight, I, uh, he's very, he has a very flat snout. It should be more extended, but I think he looks pretty cute. Um, from the, from the front like that. So yeah. Oh, and then he's got his fluffy little cotton tail. 
why are all um, rabbits named Peter? Peter Rabbit, Peter Cottontail, right? Peter Cottontail? Anyway, he's gonna go sit back on the shelf where he is. Um, I guess that's enough carrots. Um, I'm just not too happy with how his bag turned out, but he's fine with it and like it can get taken off and put somewhere else. His sweater comes off, but it's very, very tight on his arm, so I'll probably just stay on. He's a big boy. Hey, bye. Oh, it's Good Friday and like Easter and stuff. Happy Easter on Sunday and all that. And uh, I hope you have fun. Just putting him back on the shelf about my bed. I got to go to, well, I have to measure him so I can buy a box at the post office. <clears throat> I don't want to buy a box and then be like, oh, I can't fit him in here without squishing him to pieces. And of course we have Perino the pocket mouse and his little hedgehog friend. Uh, he's like, oh, you can see my little leggies at the bottom. So I hope that everyone is uh, looking at my, listening to my Welsh fairy tales that I've been reading. I don't understand them one bit. My mommy says that you should listen to my Welsh fairy tales. There's a playlist called Perino the Pocket Mouse. And all the videos that I have made or that I feature in are on that playlist, including my gaming videos and my videos just being a silly little boy. They're all there. So you should listen to the Welsh fairy tales and try to learn a lesson and then tell me what lesson you, you learned, okay? Okay, bye. I'm going to sail away now. He's going to sail away. Got to be very careful. <clears throat> He's in a very fragile boat here. It's Glenna's boat. Focus. Yes, it is Friday. And I thought we are very close to the end of this book. I think we're on chapter 18 or something, 17. We're on, cha we're on chapter 18. We're on chapter 18. Oh, I gotta bring my um, microphone closer. Oh man, it's heavy. It just keeps getting heavier. Or I keep getting weaker. Oh, I'm not a weakling. Okay, <clears throat> so. If I recall correctly, I don't remember what happened at the end of chapter 17. Oh yeah, they're there. They are in the place where they're making counterfeit pottery, counterfeit porcelain. Behind the door is a brick vault containing genuine old Chinese porcelains, all of them stolen, he explained. That's Mr. Soong translating. Only Carr and his brother possessed keys to the vault. Nancy felt a twinge of excitement. The mystery was unraveling fast now. Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. And this was the first real evidence that the swindler's brother was working with him. The group had stopped, safe for the moment. Then terror struck their hearts. Outside the wall, where the four were huddled, the horrible mastiff began to bay. Had an alarm been given? So are they outside? Oh, yeah. Remember, they um, move it. They dress themselves up like they worked there. Let's hope we avoid detection, Nancy whispered. So they're trying to save the Eng, Eng Moy. Eng. Eng Moy and his daughter. And his daughter has pretty much given up hope. She wants to, like, end it all. And now there's a dog after them. Let me just have a sip. Hello, everyone. Oh, excuse me. Having some nose issues. I want to change my chat so I have it live, live chat. Okay, here we go. 
Chapter 18, Meeting the Enemy. Escape was now impossible. Our only chance is to hide until the dog is taken away, Nancy said to Mr. Soong. Ask your friends if there's a place where we can wait without too much risk of being detected. Eng Moy led them to a small room at the extreme rear corner of the building. He pointed to a battered old brick wall. Walking to the end of it, Eng Moy pulled open a rusty iron door. As it creaked back on rusty hinges, he stepped into a dank, dark cavern and lighted a candle. Then, turning, he motioned to the others to follow. Nancy exclaimed in surprise. They were standing in a large, dome-shaped area, about eight feet high at the center. The circular brick wall was dilapidated and battered, and the rough stone flooring cracked. I'm trying to get a comfortable um, place where I'm like, like this maybe. Nancy noticed that the roof of the oven funneled into the leaning chimney. This this must have been the smelter of the old iron mine, she told Mr. Soong excitedly. The elderly gentleman spoke a few words to Eng Moy. You are right, my dear, he reported. When Eng Moy came to the enclosure, this old smelter was used as a kiln to fire pottery. But it seemed as if the chimney might topple over, so a modern kiln was constructed across the garden. Lei went off to stand watch at the far door to give notice the instant anyone might come along the corridor. Nancy, Eng Moy, and Mr. Soong sat down on the floor to await a favorable time to escape. As they marked time, the pottery maker haltingly told his friend all that had happened to him and his daughter since they had arrived in San Francisco five years before. That's a lot. Eng Moy said that the man known to him as David Carr had been a business acquaintance in China. He had tricked the Engs into coming to America by making the father promises of an important position in one of the country's modern pottery plants. As the final stop in their tour of the United States factories, Carr had lured them to the enclosure in the woods and there made them prisoners. The Engs had lived in captivity four and a half years. During that time, they had been forced to make fake Chinese porcelains, using as their models genuine, rare old pe oh, rare old using as their models genuine, rare old Oriental pieces that Carr had stolen. That was a tongue twister for me. Rare old oriental pieces. Say that five times fast. Rare old oriental pieces. But didn't the Angs ever try to escape? Nancy asked. Mr. Soon translated her question, then turned back to the girl. Yes, many times, he told Nancy. Twice they even reached the woods outside the board fence before their absence was discovered. But the dog soon found them. <coughs> Sorry. And their poor bodies still bear the marks of the whip Carr used to punish them. It's a rather revolting story, isn't it? My throat is really bothering me. And as per usual, I can't breathe enough. But all things considered, I think I'm doing pretty good. My phone also made a sound. Oh, I am so upset. So this game I've been playing for years on my phone, which I love, it's a golf-themed solitaire game. It's called Fairway Solitaire. And um, <clears throat> somehow I got logged out. Like I sign in with Facebook. So it keeps all of my progress and all my prizes and every all my everything, you know. And so I was I, I wasn't signed in and I went to sign in again. And it says, you're not, you don't have an active internet connection. My internet's fine. I've uninstalled the game, restarted my, like stopped all my apps, force stop them and then try again, but it just won't connect. And I'm 
pretty upset. It just gave me a, a um, reminder. No, actually, it wasn't that. It was another game that I started playing again since I can't play Fairway Solitaire. All right, let's get back to this absolutely crazy, violent, and intense, and soul-crushing story. Nancy's ire was aroused anew. Poor Leigh and her father had been the victims of extreme cruelty. Then it was Leigh I heard scream for help, Nancy asked. The cry that sounded like bong, which also actually sounds like something else, which I forgot. Which sounds like a scream. Yes, Mr. Soong answered. The two fang characters you saw attached to the chimney also were appeals for help. Eng Moy put them there, hoping, hoping to attract someone's attention. He shaped the characters out of old scraps of iron he found. That, of course, is why Eng took down the old ornament, Nancy observed. But who removed the new one? My friend was compelled to remove it the day he put it up, Mr. Soong said. One of the Lavender sisters saw it and punished him. Nancy's conscience pricked her. She had told the woman about it and no doubt caused this punishment. Quickly, Nancy had Mr. Soong explain this and offered her regrets. Eng Moy says he is so glad you saw it. The offense does not matter. Mr. Soong translated, the clue of the leaning chimney is the means of, fi of your finding him and Lei. Nancy was told that Eng Moy's signature, cunningly worked into the designs of various pieces of pottery, had also been intended by him as an appeal for aid. Carr had made sure his prisoners were given no opportunity to learn English. Knowing that government authorities would be trying to locate him for illegally remaining in the United States, Eng Moy hoped one of the signatures would come to the attention of federal officers and lead them to the enclosure. Are the other people, Nancy said suddenly, those men and women we saw working in the pit and in the shop, prisoners too? Mr. Soong put the question to Eng Moy. The men are foreigners. Mr. Soong translated the answer. The women are their wives. Carr and his brother smuggled them into the United States by plane. He promised them wonderful things. Then he made them prisoners. Finally, he threatened if they did not dig the clay and operate the machines, he would expose them, have them put in jail for life. This guy's a real, a real jerk. At that moment, they heard the iron door squeak open. Lay slipped into the candlelit smelter. She spoke breathlessly to her father, and from the sudden fear that flitted across his face, Nancy knew something had gone wrong. The Eng's absence has been discovered, Mr. Soong told her with alarm. Carr and the woman are out in the corridor. Motioning to the others to wait, Nancy stole from the old smelter into the shadowy room outside and listened. You fool! cried a man's voice. If you'd paid more attention to the Angs, they couldn't have disappeared. They can't have gone far, the Lavender sister replied. Get the dog, Carr said shortly. She and that father of hers are probably in the smelter room. My mastiff will attend to them. Nancy turned and ran softly back to the smelter. They're coming, she whispered. Eng Moy blew out the candle and the four waited with mounting suspense in the dark. Then, after an interval that seemed to be years, a voice, spark a voice spoke sharply in Chinese outside the iron door. It is Carr, Mr. Soon whispered fearfully to Nancy. He demands that the Engs come out. What shall we do? He asked in panic. Before she could reply that it would be best for them to slip out, Without betraying her and Mr. Soong's presence, the door was pulled open. Not the end of the chapter. She's got to, got to take a little breathing break. It's, it's 
you fraught with tension. It's too fraught with tension for me. It's too exciting. Are there any more pictures? I don't think so. Nope, no more pictures. The door was pulled open. Carr stepped into the doorway and shone a flashlight about. When he saw Nancy and Mr. Soon, his thin lips spread in a slow, mocking smile. So, I have caught you at last, he said sarcastically. The Lavender sister, who arrived with the Mastiff, gave a dry, harsh chuckle when she saw Nancy. Take the eggs away and make sure they do not try to escape again, her husband ordered. The woman beckoned sharply. With a despairing glance at Nancy and Mr. Soon, the eggs followed Carr's wife through the doorway. Nancy watched them go with a heavy heart. How happy they had been when freedom seemed so near, she reflected, and how utterly defeated they now appeared. Carr studied Nancy and her companion silently, then spoke again in a cold, sharp voice. I intend to do away with you two before any of your friends can get here to help you. End of chapter 18. Sounds like it's the end of Nancy and Mr. Zoom. That was a rather short chapter, seems. Yes, that was very short. One, two, three, four, five, six. It was only six pages. Next one's a tiny bit longer. Oh my goodness. How will Nancy and Mr. Zoom escape this time? My legs are cold. Earlier, the squirrels were talking to each other. It's so cute. Also, I, I heard, a, I, I wasn't looking out the window, but I heard a very nice bird sound. I was like, oh, that's a very fun bird sound. So I looked out and it was a crow. Crows can be very annoying or they can make really cute sounds. Actually, I think they can make any sound they want. Crows are, are very talented at vocalizations, as far as I know. What's going on with my, uh, hey. Going on with my browser. Just looking at things. Oh my gosh, that was very exciting. Look at, look at. I've got some, I've got some hair up here. I've got some hair on back here. You could pretend I had long hair down to here. I could, I could fool everyone. I thought I was going to get hot in my sweater, but I'm actually freezing. But I like it that way. Um, there's no snow here, but it could come back. I just, I don't feel at ease when the weather is so fluctuating. I am ready for spring. I cannot feel at ease until I have completely put away my winter things. Look at my roots are growing in already. My hair is getting longer. Yesterday when I washed it, I, I put a nice restructuring mask on. Okay, so I hadn't used it in like a year, over a year. Definitely over a year, way over a year. And it's in a pump bottle. And I was like, ready to use it. And I was going, oh no, I couldn't open it. I, I couldn't turn it the right way. Like I couldn't push down on it. It was locked. So I just opened it up and took out the pump thingy and I was like okay I'll squeeze a little out but nothing would come out but I know it's it's full you know I didn't I hadn't used very much of it and I, so I was like squeezing and then I was going chuck, 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 to try to like force it out but it wouldn't come out so I turned my water off and I really had to work at it but it's because it's like so thick it's a very bad um, container to put it in it should be in some kind of a tub where you can go in and scoop There's no way it's coming out that thing. I mean, I couldn't even get it out without the pump thingy in there. So there's no, like, it's going to, 
it's way too sick to go through that thing, you know, the little tube and then it works really good and I love it, but I don't know who decided to put it in a puck bottle. Mm. It's good. It's good. Oh, well, should we continue? Okay, let's continue. Chapter 19, Escape at David Carr's harsh words. Mr. Soong moaned. Nobody, Carr shouted angrily. It's going to interfere with me and get away with it. You, Nancy Drew, have interfered with my plan since the first time you saw me on the Three Bridges Road. And I'll keep on interfering. <clears throat> and I'll keep on interfering until you and your brother are locked behind bars, Nancy retorted. Carr's face tightened. Ah, so you know about my brother? I do, Nancy declared hoping it would induce the swindler to reveal what part his brother had played in Carr's nefarious schemes. Instead, Carr said, You are very clever. Since you probably know it, I'll admit he stole the vase from the Townsends and the jade elephant from your home. Nancy nodded. Why did he bother to steal the vase when he knew it was a fake? My wife is to blame for that, he replied harshly. Because of her stupidity, Ang Moy was able to paint his name on several porcelains I sold. My brother and I stole back as many as we could. We were afraid the signature would be traced by federal dicks. I've never heard that in a Nancy Drew book. As I was reading, I saw that word coming up and I was like, what? What? It means detectives. I think. It's like an old timey word for detectives. Federal dicks. You managed to remove Ang Mo Ang's name and sold the Townsend vase again. But who posed as Mr. Soong to collect the money orders in Masonville? She asked quickly, hoping to catch Carr off guard. Your brother? The man was much too cagey, however, to refer to his confederate by name. He addressed his reply tauntingly to the elderly Chinese gentleman who stood listening close by. That was clever, eh, Soong? It's just too bad for Miss Drew his scheme didn't completely succeed. If she'd believed you guilty of selling fake potteries, she might have stopped meddling in my affairs and wouldn't be here now to face the consequences. I'm glad I was able to help Mr. Soong, Nancy declared hotly. Carr gave a mirthless, sardonic laugh, then turned to go. I advise you not to try to escape, he warned. The Mastiff has a nasty temper. <laughs> the Mastiff has a nasty temper and very sharp fangs. I'll be back in a few minutes and then we'll see how brave you are. This guy, this guy sounds pretty sure of himself. I need some, I need to heat some stuff up. Who is going to, well, I feel like Bess and George are going to show up and save the day or something, right? Where are they? I don't remember where they are. Does anyone remember where Bess and George are? They didn't go on this expedition. Is that correct? Was Ned in this book at all? I think so. I think so. I'm pretty sure. I'm getting all my books mixed up. Looking at my bunny. This is a teddy bear that I've had for decades. My uncle Wally gave it gave him to me. His nose embroidery is falling down. <laughs> he has a lot of issues, but I named him Nigel. He also has um, a hole in his some holes in his foot from my from my rats. Who are in heaven now. Anyway, I called him Nigel. He doesn't have any of his stuff, but he had a scarf and he had a backpack, which had slippers folded in, like slippers for me. And what else did you have? You had some other stuff. 
I don't remember, but he had something else. Anyway, he looks very old fashioned and I love him. I can fix his little nose here. Can't remember about the story, me either. He always, well, he like sleeps on the bed beside me, but he's always down on the floor in the morning. And I'm like, what are you doing down there? He jumps out of bed every night. Even though Perino is, is looking over him. Perino's not, not the best. He's not a watch mouse. He's a sailor. He's not a security guard. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you, well, you can't see. Um, I bought a lip liner that matches, that goes with the, the lipstick that I had bought, the red lipstick. Yeah, my lips are red. You probably can't tell. Anyway, I was doing the lip liner and I accidentally went out of the lines a lot. So I, I tried to do it the same on the other side. And so my lips, my lips look really stupid. Ooh, it's really stupid on the top. It goes like, Ooh. oh, you can see it now. See? Oh, that looks terrible. It goes. Ooh. It's really good lip liner. So it was hard to take off to fix it. So I just made it look stupid on the other side too. I don't remember the end of this book. Like a lot of books, I remember the general theme of them, but not specific situations that happen. And that's one of them. I think it's going to have a happy ending, though. One thing I like at the end of the books is everyone's all happy and Nancy's like, oh, I want to start a new mystery right away. And they tell you which one it is. Oh, my legs. Oh, not two minutes and 22 seconds. I don't know why I'm dancing. Hey, I'm not wearing the shirt I always wear. You know which one I'm talking about? Not wearing it. Well, I would never wear. I don't understand how some people can wear long sleeves and long sleeves over the long sleeves. Just the thought of that. Wearing something long sleeved and then wearing something long sleeved over it. Like if I was wearing the sweatshirt and then I put a denim jacket over it. I can't. I, I don't even want to think about it. Ugh. Ooh, good, good, good. I like wearing my hair up. The old me is back. So I guess I'm just going to let my roots grow in to a point where it's easy for me to do them myself because I really don't want, or I could go back to the lady and be like, okay, this time all I want is my roots done. You don't have to tone them. You don't have to well, wash it out, but like, don't do any styling. Don't blow dry it so that it won't cost much. But then, I don't know, maybe I, I, I mean, I've, I've been blonde many, many times over the decades and I always do it myself. And my only problem is like, I, I don't know how to section things. And also now it, because of my um, issues with my, my arm, and this side here, it's harder for me, I noticed, to like do things with my hair. <laughs> but, oh, how come I can't grab here easily? Let's do a test. See, this is my good side. This is how I put my earplugs in. I go, but I can't do it with a side, so I just go like that. But like, mm -hmm. Hey, which flower should I wear? This one? <laughs> I don't have enough hair to stick it in. Right 
How about none? Oh, I could put it on my glasses, right? I can't. I, my hand-eye coordination for looking, doing things while looking in there is not a, hey, that's kind of fun. Come on. It would look better if they were both the same. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. They're like those things they put on a horse, right? I don't understand some things that are done to horses. I value my peripheral vision. Don't horses need theirs? I'll have to ask that to my cousin, Sue. She's a horse person. Oh, well, um, my breast cancer surgery. I had lymph nodes removed, and it's all very, very sore still on this side and numb. And <clears throat> I don't have the mobility that I used to. Or like, I can't my muscles and everything that's been done in there isn't the way it used to be. Like when I reach for something up, I normally go with this side because I'm right-handed. And then I'm like, oh, I can't quite reach that. So I'll go with this one instead. But I shouldn't be avoiding doing things with this. And I'm trying not to. But I like I used to be much more flexible. Oh well. Okay, these things are like impeding my vision. <clears throat> Starting to get hot. Okay, I gotta take my sweater off. I'm like, it finally happened. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. Oh, I'm freezing. I'm freezing. This is a shirt that I cut the bottom of. Oh, right. You wanna see what I did? Because I cut it. <laughs> I cut it up to here because I like to tie knot in my shirts. I'm a knot girl. I just think knots make everything look better. Oh, you know what else? <clears throat> Cottage cheese also makes everything better. I'm a big egg noodle person. I don't like put things in with my egg noodles, cheese and sauce and stuff. It's like something's missing here. I was like, cottage cheese. I'll put some cottage cheese in it. And I take the cottage cheese and I just go. And all of a sudden, it's like 100 times better. I believe that will work with any food. If it's just missing something, cottage cheese. Also, I read a few years ago, um, put cottage cheese in your scrambled eggs. And I was like, mm, seems like a waste of cottage cheese because I like to just eat the cottage cheese. Um, but I did. And it was really yummy. But I feel like that's a waste of cottage cheese because it's better just to eat it. Thank you. It's a it's a long process. Also, <clears throat> the hormone therapy that I have to take for years also causes a lot of stiffness and joint issues. So, but overall, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Yes, I did microwave this because. My favorite place in the world, Sonnenberg Gardens. I haven't been there for years, but I'm going to go again. I feel like I made it. Last time I went, I took many, many pictures. And I feel like I made a video of it, but I'm not sure. Maybe I should do a picture or like a picture slideshow of video of Sonnenberg Gardens with the pictures I took. Some nice gardeny music because I have them all saved. Got to move that onto my external hard drive. Yeah, so I started, um, 
I was like, okay, I'm going to do the trailer for Invisible Intruder. And I put that up. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start it. I'm reading it myself and I'm getting to the halfway point, reading it to myself. And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to start because it's still going to be a while before I get my new computer. And I just, I was having withdrawal symptoms or something. I'm like, I have to record. So I started it and it's a fine book. Everybody's in it. We've got Ned, Bert and Dave, Nancy, Bess and George. And there's like, was it five different mysteries? At the beginning, all the mysteries that they are going to be solving are all introduced by Helen and Jim. And um, yeah, they're going on various, they're going to various different locations to solve mysteries, all involving, involving ghosts. Ooh. I've always had a fear of sea, sea creatures, like underwater things, fish, octopuses. And, ugh, so it's kind of creepy to me, but it's definitely fun. So that's good. All right, let's get back to this. Where were we? Oh, yeah, he's going to make minced meat out of them. He swung the iron door shut. Nancy found the candle and lighted it. She turned to Mr. Soom, who had sat down on the floor, too weak to stand any longer. It's my fault you're in this dangerous situation, he murmured to Nancy. I shouldn't have asked you to come with me. Nancy smiled wanly. Please do not feel bad. It was my own wish to untangle this mystery that brought us here. She crossed the door to listen. She crossed to the door to listen, hoping the dog might be gone. But the mastiff outside, sensing her presence near the iron barrier, uttered a low, menacing growl. Nancy took the candle and started to examine the battered brick walls. There had to be some way of escape. Suddenly, the iron door creaked slowly open. Standing in the doorway was Mr. Sing, Mr. Soong's short, inscrutable-looking servant, Ching. He regarded them impassively, then gave them a toothy smile. Ching! Mr. Soong arose and advanced toward him eagerly. He spoke excitedly to the servant in Chinese. But Ching suddenly gave a boisterous laugh and roughly pushed his gentle employer away. Fool, he cried in English. Are you so stupid you cannot guess who I really am? Carr's brother, Nancy exclaimed. Ching made her a mock bow. Exactly. This is a bad guy. What? I'm confused. Is it the same guy who was... Ching earlier, and he's he's not really Ching. He's Car's brother, or is he pretending? Or is he Car's brother pretending to be Ching? As usually happens, all the questions I'm asking are probably explained in the next paragraph. Now I understand several things. Nancy said, "You were the one who posed as Mister Soong and cashed the money orders." Yes, Miss Drew. Ching replied mockingly, "But my impersonation need not concern you any longer." You made a fatal mistake in coming here. Now you must pay for your stupidity. He chuckled contemptuously. There's an old American saying, curiosity killed the cat. You see the parallel, Miss Drew, I'm sure. There's no use threatening us. You know my father will come and bring the police, Nancy burst out. Wouldn't you like us to believe that, Miss Drew? Ching taunted. But unfortunately for you, I know that your father is in Washington. You see, I called his office, intending to tell him that you would be uh, slightly late for dinner. Nancy realized how serious her plight was, but there was a ray of hope. 
When she did not return to dinner, Mrs. Gruen certainly would telephone the Miltons. And when the housekeeper learned that Nancy and Mr. Soong had gone to the enclosure, she would call the police. Sparring for time, she continued to ask questions, which Ching freely answered. He said it had been prearranged between David and himself, but he would get a job at Mr. Soong's. In this way, he could watch the man's mail and waylay any messages about the Engs. At all times, he kept track of his employer's movements. But once you slipped, Nancy spoke up. But once you slipped, Nancy spoke up. A letter about the Engs did reach Mr. Soong. Unfortunately, yes. Then you came into the case, Miss Drew. But you shall never bother my brother or me again. As soon as we have removed our valuable property, Ching said defiantly, we will come back and dynamite the leaning chimney. When it collapses, it will crush the roof of the smelter. He paused significantly. Your fate will not be pleasant, but let us hope the end will be swift. For several seconds after Ching had departed, Nancy and Mr. Soon were too dazed even to talk. It occurred to Nancy that Mrs. Gruen would not be concerned about her absence until the dinner hour. The housekeeper would act promptly then, but it might be too late. Desperately, Nancy began to ch- Desperately, Nancy began to try to figure some way out of their dreadful plight. There isn't a chance of escaping through the door with the mastiff on, go- on guard, she pointed out. Hey, I'm just looking. I'm just looking at this thing. Holding the candle above her head, Nancy stared at the dome-like roof of the old smelter. The opening which funneled into the leaning chimney was about two feet in diameter. Through the opening, she could just see a patch of sunlit sky. A thought clicked, and she turned excitedly to Mr. Soon. Didn't Eng Moy get up the inside of this chimney to attach the iron symbol, she asked? Yes, he said he used a ladder and went up from here, the elderly gentleman replied. There was no ladder in the smelter. Nancy again peered up the chimney. Ladder or no ladder, she promptly decided to try the climb. Please help me get up, she said. Mr. Soong's eyes widened. You don't intend to climb the chimney, he asked in alarm. I must, Nancy told him. It's our only chance of escape. But you might slip and fall. Nothing would be worse than the fate that awaits us here, Nancy pointed out. But if I can make the climb... I may be able to bring help to you and your friends before it's too late. Recognizing that there was no choice, the Chinese, exerting his last ounce of strength, permitted Nancy to stand on his back so she could reach into the opening. As Nancy pulled herself up inside, Mr. Soon looked at her anxiously. Be careful, he begged. If anything should happen to you, please don't worry. Nancy reassured him, and don't give up hope. If everything goes well, I'll be back with the police. Good fortune go with you, said Mr. Soong, sinking to the floor. Nancy began her climb. Bracing her back against one side of the chimney and her legs against the other, she started to inch up the stack. Her climb was made easier by the angle at which the chimney slanted, but the cement between the bricks was chipped and broken. With every movement she made, Nancy was in danger of dislodging a loose brick and plunging down the dank shaft to the floor of the smelter. With utmost care, she crept upward. Finally, when it seemed as if her tense, tired muscles could carry her no farther, She reached the top. 
Then she climbed carefully down the outside of the leaning chimney to the sloping roof of the old brick building. She was about to make the drop from the edge of the roof to the garden when she heard a noise. Someone's coming, she thought with alarm. Swiftly, Nancy flattened herself against the sloping roof and a moment later saw Carr's wife, now in street clothes, open the door in the stone wall and walk in her direction. My nose is itchy. As long as the woman did not look up, Nancy knew she was safe from view, but the angle at which the roof sloped made her position precarious. As Carr's wife approached, Nancy's grip suddenly weakened and she started to slide down. I can't fail now, she told herself desperately. I just can't. End of chapter 19. sweater back on. It's cold in the chimney. It's cold in the chimney. <laughs> okay. Um, man, my fingers are all red from my lipstick. I just want to keep going. I just want to keep reading. Should I keep reading? Uh, is she going to fall? Uh. Actually, before I start reading, you know what I feel like doing? Oh, I've already done it. Oh, no, there's more to add. I don't know if I did that. Oh, these are the ones that I haven't record, recorded or something. I don't know. I have some little check marks beside the titles here, trying to figure out what they mean. Hmm. Maybe these are ones, well, some of them are ones I've read live. Like the clue of the leaning chimney has a tick on it. And Mystery at the Ski Jump, which is one that I read live. The Moonstone Castle Mystery, I read live. Um, Strange Message in the Parchments. Hello. No, there's only one chapter left. Hello, Hugo. Are you new here? We're reading Nancy Drew, Clue of the Leaning Chimney. Then I also have Mystery of the Glowing Eye. That's one I haven't done yet. Secret of the Forgotten City. Did we do the spider sapphire mystery? Is that the one with the monkey? I think so. Invisible Intruder is checked. Oh, cool. For a minute, I thought I had been to Poland, but I haven't. Um, I've been, is Belgium next to Poland or like near? Anyway, I would like to go to Poland someday and see some history. I enjoy a lot of Polish food. You have great, yummy food. All right, Hugo. Hugo makes me think of someone. Oh, Hardy Boys. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's even better in Poland. But there, um, there's a Polish deli near me. I don't go very often, but anything I've got there is absolutely yummy. I, at one point, I was like, I'm going to eat sauerkraut every day because I know that it's really good for your guts for your insides, but I am from Canada, so North America. I'm Canadian. I'm I'm in Quebec, which is proudly Canadian. <laughs> oh, 
All right. Well, I want to see what's going on. No, you know, I got to get, I got to get my, my, um, I got to get my mug going here with more stuff. So I'm just going to, um, stop for a minute. We can discuss what's going on in the book. Um, oh, okay. This is the milk I drink. <laughs> I was going to say something and then I forgot. Oh, yeah. Usually my TV is on in the background, but it's not. Can you hear my kettle? It's pretty loud. <sighs> I can't wait to get my new computer. So I got to save up a bit. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just waiting for the boiling of the water. So I'm just like, looking at other stuff right now. <laughs> just looking at other things. Um, let's see. Just, just looking around. When I don't have anything where it's in front of me, help, help, help. The next, oh, wait a minute. Oh, we just finished that. Right. I, I was open to uh, the wrong chapter here. Next, final chapter. Chapter 20, a fitting reward. What will the reward be? Oh, probably a vase, right? I'm kind of upset. I don't remember that Mr. Soong was an imposter the whole time. Because I kind of like, not Mr. Soong, sorry, Ching. I kind of enjoyed the character of Ching. But now knowing that he was a bad guy all along is kind of disappointing. Bye. I'm going to put something over. I, I don't want everyone looking at me all the time. So like, I'm still here. Don't you worry. But I'm going to put this like this. But I'm still here. See? I'm still here. Beep, 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 beep. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. Should I put more coffee in it? It's always hard when you have like a little bit of coffee left. So you're not sure, but you want to fill the cup, but you're not sure exactly what you should put in it. So I put a little more coffee. And I'm going to put in a little tiny bit more milk. So it's either going to taste very weak or very strong. Both of those are bad. Too strong is bad. And not strong enough is also bad. And I'm stirring. And I'm putting down my cup. And I love thrift books. Okay, how did I start reading books on here? Well, well, sir. Um, I had I had been listening to. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, I had been listening to the first books in the series, um, the audio books by, read by Laura Linney, 
they were all up on YouTube and I listened to them many times for like helping me fall asleep. And then they were all taken down and then some were put back up. And I was like, you know what? I like reading out loud, but I don't have anyone to read to really in my, in my life. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I can try doing an audio book. So I did. And I, I mostly, one of the, one of the other reasons I started was because I don't feel very comfortable speaking aloud. I know it's not the same as it's like you're reading from a script, right? You don't have to come up with anything to say yourself. But I just had issues with maybe the way I spoke. I, I just did it for like some more self-confidence, I guess. And so that's kind of how I started. I started with the clue of the broken locket. And then I think I did quest of the missing map. And I it just went on from there. So that's how I started um, reading books on here. Before that, I just had like some knitting videos on the channel. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll try this. And so it kind of like gradually turned into more of a reading channel. Yep. Let us test this and see if it burns me or makes me sick. I taste the milk. The honey taste is gone because I put it, some honey in it first. But I think I like it. It's not too coffee-ish, but it's not too milkish too. Okay, I'm okay with it. All right, let's start chapter 20. Chapter 20, a fitting reward. Frantically, Nancy pressed her hands harder against the roof. And just when it seemed she must tumble to the ground, her momentum stopped. Carr's wife paused to listen, but evidently did not detect the sound as coming from the roof. Finally, she returned to the door in the stone wall and went through. Nancy breathed with relief. Landing lightly on the spongy turf below the roof, she ran to where she had hidden the rope ladder. It was still there. Hooking the ladder to the top of the wooden fence, Nancy climbed over quickly. She tossed the ladder behind a tree and ran headlong. Taking a circuitous route to avoid detection, she finally came to the parked car. She drove as swiftly as possible along the gravel lane, then sped toward Three Bridges Road. Circuitous? I learned that book from Nancy Drew. It's in, I don't remember which story I, I read it in first. But I was like, how do I say this word? I've learned a lot of words too. <laughs> um, when I'm recording and there's a word I come to and I, I don't know how to say it, first I say it how I think it would be said. And then I list, I search it and I, I find the actual pronunciation. Usually I'm right, but sometimes I'm completely wrong, like the dinosaur. Um, Diplodocus. I say Diplodocus. It was from Dina Girls, Diplodocus. So I say it wrong in the recording because I don't know, it's just like, what else could it be? It must be Diplodocus or Diplodocus. Right, Diplodocus is correct, but I was like, I never would have thought of that. To me, it's Diplodocus. Okay. Uh, she's speeding toward Three Bridges Road. Crossing the intersection, not 20 feet in front of her, was the familiar car of a state trooper. Nancy blew a long blast on her horn, and the police car stopped. She slipped out of the convertible and ran toward the trooper. Thank goodness you're here, she told him. I need help right away. What's wrong, miss? Nancy apprised him of the situation. Looks as if, looks as if we'll need plenty of help the trooper said grimly. He radioed his district headquarters, and after a short wait, they were joined by six state troopers in a patrol car. With Nancy leading the way, they sped toward the enclosure. I just can't imagine six police officers in one police car. 
There's something clownish about it, you know? Like clowns in a car? I don't know. Mm. So on YouTube, I'm um, subscribed to a channel called Fuzzy Memories, and they play old broadcasts of all kinds of things, mostly from the 70s and 80s, like TV shows, shows and movies and a lot of news shows, like the whole broadcast with all the commercials and everything. And in my... in. I think it was yesterday, they uploaded um, a show with Bozo the Clown, Bozo's Circus. And I just started watching it and I was like, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. So maybe that's why I thought of clowns. Anyway, I'm but digressing very much. With Nancy leading the way, they sped toward the enclosure. The men went over the fence at various locations to make their roundup complete. Nancy and two of the officers went at once to the old brick building to free Mr. Soon. None of the criminals was in sight, but some of the workers were arrested. Sorry. Mm -mm. Since none of them could speak English, they could tell the police nothing about Carr and his brother. You'll have an ugly dog to tackle in a minute, Nancy warned the troopers as they went on toward the old smelter. That's not nice. I don't think any dogs are ugly. I know she doesn't mean ugly looking, ugly behavior, like I'm going to chomp you into little bits, but I just think it's mean. Nancy has bad luck with dogs, though. We'll take care of him. To Nancy's surprise, the Mastiff was gone. Nancy was puzzled. What of Mr. Soong? She darted to the door of the, of the smelter and yanked it open. The place was empty. He's been taken away, she cried despairingly. The troopers looked at her. Had they come too late? Nancy had a sudden inspiration. I believe I know where everybody is, she said. She led the men to the large corridor vault where Eng Moy had said the valuable potteries were locked up. As Nancy expected, the door would not open, but she could detect a faint whine from within. She told the men she suspected the criminals and their mastiff were inside. Come out of there at once, one of the troopers commanded. There was utter silence. Suddenly, Nancy realized that if her Chinese friends were inside with the criminals, they might be afraid to answer. So she called loudly. It's Nancy Drew. I've come with help. From inside came a cry of joy from Ang Lei, but it was stifled at once. The troopers said they would batter down the door if it were not opened immediately. At last, from the interior of the vault, their faces sullen, came Carr holding the dog by the leash, his wife and Ching. Behind them were Mr. Soong and the Engs, who blinked happily. The story was soon told. When Carr had discovered Nancy gone, he had rounded up his wife and brother to make a getaway. But Nancy had arrived with the police too soon. By hiding in the vault, Carr had hoped to make the group think he and Ching and the others already had left. Before leaving, the cars would have disposed of the old Chinese and his friends. The workers outside did not know enough to give damaging evidence against the brothers. You meddlesome creature, Carr's wife burst out, pointing a finger at Nancy. You're to blame for our capture. In another year, we would have become rich enough to leave this place forever but you had to come snooping and spoil it all. I always forget what I said. What are you gonna check out, Hannah? What are you gonna check out? I forgot what I said. Oh, Bozo the Clown? <laughs> she is mad. At that moment, another of the troopers approached to report that all the workers in the place had been captured. Nancy quickly introduced Mr. Soong, who was allowed to go. 
All the others would have to be held for questioning, the officer said. But he was sure the Engs would be allowed to stay at Mr. Soong's home. Tell Eng Moy and Eng Lei goodbye for me, Mr. Soong, please, Nancy said with a smile. But you will see them again, the old impo- I was going to say imposter. It was like broken on the line with a dash and and I just saw Im. But you will see them again, the old importer promised. They will not return to China at once. The next day, Mr. Drew, back from Washington, and thankful his daughter was safe, talked over the mystery with Nancy. The cars and Ching, they learned from the police, had signed a complete confession. One of the things I'm most curious about, Mr. Drew remarked, is how Carr and Ching obtained possession of the enclosure. Nancy showed her father a copy of the confession. It said the Kaolin. It said the discoverer of the Kaolin had been the brother's great grandfather. His son had worked the pit for a while, but had moved away. Then his son, the father of David and Ching, had gone to China as a merchant, and the property had been sold for taxes, but never used. Is Ching his real name? Thank you, Jennifer. It's Jenny from Anaheim. Perino was on earlier. Perino, oh, here he is. Perino, Perino, it's Jenny from Anaheim. Anaheim. Hello, Jenny from Anaheim. How's it going? Say hi to Donald Duck for me. I don't care about no Mickey Mouse. Well, sail away. He don't care about Mickey Mouse. She said hi. Annie. Jenny from Anaheim. <laughs> Annie from Anaheim. <sighs> um, oh, yeah. Who, who's this Jing guy? WonderCon. So that is some kind of convention with um, cartoon characters, comic book people, TV people. I don't know, but have fun. Sounds like a lot of fun stuff happening in Anaheim. Yeah, Ching. Then his son, the father of David and Ching, had gone to China as a merchant and the property had been sold for taxes, but never used. Records, testifying to the existence and location of the pit, had lain untouched in Shanghai for many years. Then, five years ago, David Carr and his brother had found the records and had immediately come to the United States to look over the pit, using the name of the geologist Miles Monroe to avoid suspicion. Carr had purchased the tract of land, despite the fact that it did not have a clear title. Here's something interesting, Nancy said. The Cars had later learned that a man named Peterson had left papers which might upset their claim to the pit. David had been given a lead to the former owner of Mrs. Wendell's house in Masonville, and this was the telephone conversation Dick Milton had overheard six months ago. Carr, using the name of Manning, had gone to her home, taken a room, and stolen the papers he wanted as Nancy had guessed. He had installed the secret panel leading to the empty attic. Ne he had installed the secret panel leading to the empty attic next door to keep some of the valuable potteries there in case the enclosure in the woods was raided. You spiked that one early in the game, Nancy, Mr. Drew grinned. And you figured all along that the religious colony was just a camouflage. Well, in a way, the discovery of the leaning chimney in Masonville was a lucky coincidence. Nancy smiled. If I hadn't found that, I might not have uncovered the secret of the enclosure. Paragraph break. The fuzzy memory, that's right. Or fuzzy memories, it's called. It makes me feel very nostalgic, it's mostly 70s and 80s. And it just makes me think of being a child 
Some of it is before I was born, but a lot of it is when I was a child. I think it's a, uh, I think there was this lady, I don't know if she's still alive, but I can't remember her name. There's a Wikipedia article about her and she taped everything on TV for years. And she had like storage spaces full of these VHSs. Like she just kept recording and recording and it all has been collected and archived and stuff. I don't know if some of it is from her. It's. I think it's all from Chicago or something like that. Or maybe I'm thinking of another channel. I watch a lot of old stuff. A week later, Mr. Soong held a party in honor of the Engs. Nancy and Mr. Drew were there, as well as Bess and George, Dick and Connie, and Ned Nickerson. Nancy noted with satisfaction that displayed on the living room mantle were Mr. Soong's jade elephant and the dragon Ming vase, which had been recovered from the swindlers. After dinner, Mr. Soong made a short, touching speech expressing the debt of grat gratitude he and the Engs owed Nancy. Ben Lay stepped forward, holding in her hands an exquisite vase. Against a soft green background was pictured a slender, golden-haired girl pitting a lance at a scaly green dragon. Behind her stood a Chinese girl and two men in long oriental robes. That sounds beautiful. Makes me want to look up some old artwork. Or if I had like artistic abilities of painting and drawing, I would, I would make a creation of how I imagine it. As Lei presented the vase to a surprised Nancy with a warm smile, she spoke in Chinese. What is she saying? Nancy asked Mr. Soong. Lei is trying to tell you that she and her father made this for you. Like all Chinese work, the design tells a story, he explained. The girl is Nancy Drew. The three Chinese are Lei, Moi, and myself whom you are protecting from the evil dragon, Ching Kar, and his wife. Wow. He turned the vase bottom up. It says, made in the hearts of Eng Moi and Eng Lei. It's lovely, she whispered. Thank you, Nancy said simply. Thank you very much. She started to turn away, but there was a burst of applause from the smiling circle of guests. Speech! George prompted, spurring the others to even greater hand clapping. Nancy looked helplessly at Mr. Soong. Please do, he urged, smiling. Go ahead, Nancy, Ned spoke up. I'll do my best, she promised with a little laugh. There aren't any words to express the way I feel about this face. It's more to me than just a gift. It's a token of friendship, a bond between me three of the nicest people I've ever known. I'll treasure it always. Applause burst out again as she finished. Then the circle broke up and Nancy found herself in the court, in one corner of the room with Bess, George, and Ned. Well, Nancy, Ned said with a teasing grin, now that you've located the china clay and the missing eggs, what are you going to do next? Next, Nancy replied. I'm going to tell you a secret. Mr. Soong is lending Dick the money to acquire the china clay, and the Engs are going to stay in America, for a while at least, and work with him making potteries. And now, she added, laughing, I'm ready and willing to take on any new mystery that comes along. Although Nancy did not know it then, the mystery was to be the baffling, exciting adventure the secret of the wooden lady. Meanwhile, Nancy whispered to Bess, I think I'll join you in the ceramics class. Now that I've learned from Ching and Carr what not to do in making potteries, I'd better take a few tips from Dick on what to do. The end. The end. We finished the book. 
I'm going to have to go back to the first chapter and see when that was, see when the date was. That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. This one took us a while. That one took us a big while. We finished. We finished. Yeah. I really love the description of the story on the, on the vase. Really nice. So we're done. That's it. That's all. Time to microwave my coffee again. I don't know. Like some, some mugs keep it hotter than others, right? Depending on what they're made of and how thick they are and all that, right? I guess. I don't know. Thanks for the hearts. I wish I could send hearts. I can't. I used to be able to send hearts and things, but now I don't see the, the option for me. And when I'm on other people's lives too, I don't see the option. All I see is the box where you with the cursor where you put your chat messages. I see the happy face to add emoticons. And I see a plus sign that says engage with your audience. Oh. Did you enjoy the book? Yes, no, and I will add an option. There, I started a poll. Did you enjoy the book? Yes, no. What book? <laughs> wow, somebody already voted. <laughs> Now I'm like at a loss. What do I do? What do I do? I put this back in. I put this back in my shelf. Also, I got to put this, these people, these little people back on the shelf. I'm so afraid I'm going to accidentally break the boat. I think Glenna would be so happy to know that she has some little guys in her boat. I know she would be. I know she would love them. Well, you know, I'm going to put the link for the Bozo show. I can stick it right in the chat. Um, oh, wait, can I? Because I don't know if I have it here. It's called Bozo's Circus. W. No. Oh, okay. It's the Museum of Classic Chicago Television. And then in brackets, it says www.fuzzymemories.tv. I'm going to copy the link. 1979. This is from 1979. I was one year old. My cat, Herbie, is still visiting his grandparents. I'm going to go visit soon and see him. He's, uh, he's doing very well. He's doing very well. I miss him. But every time I, I talk with my parents or my brother, um, they tell me how he's doing and stuff. So, yeah, I miss him. He's still my boy. I miss my rats. They're in heaven now, but um, yeah, rats are, are great little pets. I wish they lived longer. Oh, they're so sweet. But now, well, right now I, I don't have any pets inside. <laughs> and then I know the squirrels and, and, and the, uh, the birds aren't my pets, but I feel like they're my little friends because I feed them and stuff. I'd feed them a lot more if there wasn't the Italian garden guy across because the people next door to me feed them all kinds of nuts and things. But they also have a lot of foliage and big trees in their space. So they don't have like 
a, a clear view of the Italian garden man. I'm right across from him with like no kind of coverage of trees or foliage. So yeah, that's it. Uh, Bozo's Circus. And they tell you everything, like everything is listed. They tell you all the commercials and timestamps and stuff on all of their videos. Here's the complete live broadcast of an edition of Bozo Circus. Bob Bell is, but I didn't watch all of it. I just kind of like skipped through it. And I was watching, uh, I watched the juggler guy. And they had this way of like choosing kids from the audience to come and, and do games. There weren't really games. Like everyone wins a prize where they'd get prizes and then people at home get prizes who had sent in cards and stuff. And it was like, I'm not afraid of clowns. A lot of people are afraid of clowns. I'm not, I'm not especially fond of them. I'm just kind of neutral on clowns. How do you guys feel about clowns? I mean, like, yeah, I've never thought, wow, oh, that's creepy, scary. There are clowns who are intentionally meant to be creepy and scary. And that's one thing. And then there are, you know, real clowns. And people find them scary a lot. And I, I don't, I don't have a problem with them. I, I, what's the word? I'm ambivalent. Is that the word? I'm going to look it up. Like, I don't really care one way or the other. I feel no strong feelings. Ambivalent. Having mixed feelings. Or... No, I don't have mixed feelings. I just don't have any feelings about them, really. What if? I like clowns. Grew up with Ronald McDonald, Bozo the Clown, Christ... Oh, I don't know Christy the Clown. I, um... When I was a kid, I had a Ronald, Mc I could find a picture of it right now, just by Googling. I had a Ronald McDonald doll. Um, it had, what's his name? The purple guy, Grimace, in his pocket. And you, would, you could like pull him out. And he had a whistle, Ronald McDonald, <laughs> Krusty the Clown. Ronald McDonald doll. He had a whistle and he had like a little hole in his mouth. And you could put the whistle in and squeeze his tummy. And then you go, Whoosh. Yeah, Krusty the Clown. He's a real jerk. <laughs> God, I can't think of any clowns. I'm going to find my Ronald McDonald doll. I'll just put in Whistle doll. Yeah, there it is. Yep, there it is. Oh, I was thinking his pocket was up here, but it's down on his hip. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I could see, like... That could scare some people. And that's what I thought. Yeah, he had like yarn, red yarn hair. What's it? Oh, here he is in his box. I don't remember his box. I knew he, I, I think he was brand new when I got him. 1978, that's the year I was born. Oh, wow. He came with like a booklet. This one has all the stuff that came with him. How much is it? Estimate. 275 to 350, but that's with his original box. Is this a Frisbee he comes with? Oh my gosh. Hug him, his whistle blows. Pull the string, Grimace shows. I will copy this if you want to click and see um, the Ronald McDonald doll I had. <laughs> He never, he's just a bit too excited, I, th I find. It's like, whoa, man, why is he so excited? If I tried to X out, if I accidentally X'd out the tab that I'm running here, where YouTube, where my live is running, I wonder if it would come up with a warning and say, are you sure you want to close this tab? Or if it would just close? Should I try it? I'm going to try it. No, it said, this page is asking you con to confirm that you want to leave information you've entered. Okay. So I can't accidentally like close the browser and then I'm gone from here. 
That's good to know. Well, what do I do now? What do I do now? Well, I've been on for an hour and a half, so I think uh, it's time for me to... Uh, I was trying to remember if I had leftovers from yesterday. No, I, I washed my pot this morning. Did I? Oh, no, it's still soaking in the water, in the soapy water. Bye, Hannah. Thanks for joining us. We did three chapters and finished a whole book. It was nice to talk to you. I hope you enjoy some Bozo the Clown. Bye. Yeah, I'm going to go now. Goodbye. All the uh, animals over here say bye. And hey, maybe I'll do a poll to see which book we want to read next. Yeah, I'm going to go pick some that I haven't read. Either, well, I'm not going to pick one that I've done an audiobook of, a regular audiobook, but I'll choose one that I haven't done any recording of. And we'll read it live. If you want to, I don't know. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to see some pictures. Have a great day. Bye, Jenny from Anaheim. Well, everyone's leaving, so I will too. Bye. And we mean it.